the main conversation about Netscope when I first started getting involved with it, it was at the height of COVID. So it was looking at just implementing web security in a cloud-based format for people who now found their entire workforce were working at home. Uh, it's now the conversation is mainly being dominated by DLP. So we'll we'll focus on that today as an example as to, to lead us through each of the stages of this. So on screen at the moment, we've got our, our test tenant. So this is the summer for test tenant for Netscope. This is how it would look if you if you had to administer Netscope, it's just a single interface that you log into. You have a URL, so it's cloud-based technology. You would go to that, you would log into it, you can put MFA onto that. We have got the Okta MFA integrated with this. Uh, so we've got central user management and we've got the uh, token-based authentication when you log into it because it's public-facing uh, cloud terminal. You can put a range of IPs onto it to, to further reduce access. I haven't seen many customers do that because of the nature of the product. Uh, locking them down, coming in from certain IPs. Most of the workforce, again, working from home, very difficult to do unless you're using some kind of VPN. So here is the main dashboard. You can fully customize this if you want to. I don't, it's just a test tenant. I've mainly pushed data like this out into Splunk. It's easy enough to set up for some integration for CM. It's just a little, uh, token-based API call that you can make in your CM tool and it will get all the Netscope events and so on. Build yourself a dashboard or use the Netscope app and add on in Splunk if that's what you're using. So I tend not to touch this, but it's there if you want to, you can fully customize what's on this main screen. Uh, so if we think of it from DLP point of view, so the first thing we could think of is Secure Web Gateway. So what is it now Secure Web Gateways are used for? It used to be, that companies would have a whole range of allowed categories, unallowed categories, uh, <clears throat> certain websites they didn't want users visiting. It would usually be uh, an acceptable use policy that would be created within the company. Maybe HR might have some buy into that. They might say that we don't want users visiting adult websites, visiting gambling websites and so on. Uh, more and more when I talk to customers that they don't seem to focus on that now. There are certain customers, such as in finance and so on, they do have a rigid acceptable use policy, but I hear more and more now it's a an acceptable use policy. They trust their users to kind of do what they want on their machines. It's like a, a, a limited uh, acceptable use policy, but they will still block, say, an adult website but they might no longer block gambling, games, and so on. Some of the customers, the enterprise level customers that I've dealt with even make their own in-house games for mental health reasons, for people to play on their, their breaks and so on, that they don't block games anymore. And I, I remember that being a big thing. As social, they don't tend to block social. There are some customers that are blocking social these days. Uh, but they block it to stop you logging into it and so on, but they will allow you to browse it. But we'll go into that and we'll look at the activity side of this. Uh, so if we just start with Secure Web Gateway. So Secure Web Gateway now is mainly being used to stop people exfiltrating data. So how would you do that? If we were to click a new policy here and we've got web access. So this is us looking at a Secure Web Gateway uh, policy. We can choose our users. So again, users you could be pulling in from uh, Active Directory, you could be pulling in from uh, Azure AD, you could be pulling in from Okta, etc. can fully function with these types of IDP tools. So I could be doing this via groups. I've got some groups here that I've pulled in from AD, from Okta, some users that I've populated from these, from OU. You can set up now, and this wasn't in the last video that I made on this, but you can now do it as unknown. So if a user does have a, a connection via Netscope to the web, such as via the client, or their traffic is coming in, uh, they're being badged in some way coming through the tenant, and they're not registered in the, the tenant, you can create a policy for them so that everyone can still be captured whether they're in Netscope or not. So if we were to pick, say, a user here, what would we want to block from a, 
a security or DLP point of view. Well, out of the box, they've got rings and rings of these uh, categories. All secure web gateways have these category lists. The main ones I see getting blocked are Netscope group these security risk ones together. So we can see we've got phishing and fraud, spam sites, and so on. Well, they use sites like abuse.ch, uh, a whole range of sources, and they're updating these all the time with new content. And so I would tend to have these on for a client at the very least, the security risk ones. Then we're looking at things like uncategorized, so brand new websites. There is a new category if I scroll up here, which is newly registered domain and so on, where it's checking when that domain is actually registered, if it's brand new, uh, miscellaneous, things like that you could be blocking. Things that are unknowns, the type of things that, if I was to create some kind of phishing uh, tool now, if I was to use a site-based uh, phishing attack, I'm going to spin up a box in AWS, you know, like an Apache web server. I'm going to start sending out links, trying to get people to come to my fake login pages that are on that box and so on. Well, that site's not going to be categorized in any way initially. So therefore, walking on categorized would be ideal. And then if it does end up being categorized, uh, it's probably going to be caught by then under one of these security risk ones if it's been triggered in some way as being uh, caught to be a phishing site. I've noticed that the phishing attacks that I've seen, the legit ones that I've been sent, uh, they're using Google Drive. So you wouldn't be able to block it in a secure web tool if they were using Google Drive because you're actually just accessing Google Drive. But that leads us into the, the DLP aspect of this because I have seen customers are blocking, blanket blocking cloud storage. So they are only allowing cloud storage by exception. Uh, it's certain uh, sites out there. You've got Office 365, G, uh, Google Drive, Box, Dropbox, et cetera, all major data exploitation points. Anyone can go to these sites. Anyone can register for a free account on them. So therefore, they want to stop people uploading to them. Uh, one thing you can do, though, is rather than go that hard and fast blocking, you can see here that I've chosen cloud storage here as my category. Under the next gen secure web gateway aspect is we can actually be blocking activities on these. So you can see that I could actually stop uploading, but the user can still get to the cloud storage site. Or if it was a phishing site done via Google Drive uh, with a, a site embedded in there, then we can stop login attempts and so on, stop the transmission of data, stop any kind of data going out the way to whatever that site may be but still allow the user to browse it, to view things on it, to interact with it in some way without transmitting data to it. Now that's important because the customers that I've seen that have blocked cloud storage completely as a category run into issues uh, for two main reasons. One is other companies use different cloud storage. So for example, we here at some of them, we're a Google house. So we use Google Drive for everything. We work with customers all the time that will be using Office 365, so therefore they're using OneDrive, and we might have to collaborate them, uh, collaborate with them using their OneDrive. So if we block cloud storage as a whole, I can no longer access files on their OneDrive, hence we run into issues. The other issue that you can run into is that half the internet is powered by AWS, and when you go to visit certain websites, yes, you will be visiting the domain like www.website.com but the content on that will still be getting delivered by AWS. And in the back end, it will be a Amazon S3 will show up as the provider of that information, like downloading fonts, GIFs, images, any kind of web content. The site will be categorized as one thing, but the content coming from those servers will still be showing up as Amazon S3, which comes under cloud storage. So you can end up running into some real issues if you block cloud storage as a whole. However, with the, all these activities that you can choose for cloud storage, you're in a much better place. If you only block the things that you want to, to stop the data exfiltration to them. Uh, one other aspect of it too, is if we look at constraints. So say for example, we at Summerford are a Google house. So therefore we block everything cloud storage 
except for Google Drive. That's the only thing that we should be using. Well, what would stop me from logging in to Google Drive using a personal account? If I'm allowed to get to the site, I can still register for a personal account. I can still log in as a personal account. All Netscope is seeing is that I'm going to Google Drive. So therefore, I could download all my company files onto my machine. Then I could upload them straight into a personal instance. Well, that's where constraints come in. So you can see here, I've got a matches work domain here. And I've got a does not match work domain. Well, when we are allowed to pick the login option as an activity, if I come back to my web access, uh, it might not be able to do this with cloud storage, but we'll try. So if I choose cloud storage here, and then we choose our login attempt, you can see that I get to choose the constraint here. So I could have a policy that says, allow the login attempt if it matches work domain, block, which would be my Summerford address, block it if it does not match my work domain. So therefore, if it's not a Summerford address. So if I went to Google Drive and I logged in as my Summerford employee account, it would allow me into the site. If I now go to it and I use a Gmail account, my personal account, it would not allow me to log into the site. So therefore, again, we're not completely shutting down cloud storage as a whole, we're picking and choosing, we're granularly able to choose the activities, the login uh, format, et cetera, to give our users the freedom to do what they need to do, but also give us the blanket security to stop that data exfiltration taking place. Now, when it comes to your secure web gateway, yes, we've got threat protection as an option, that's pretty standard for secure web gateways. So all traffic up and down is going to be checked. Again, Netscope are constantly taking feeds of threats and signatures and hashes and things like that uh, and updating this all the time. So therefore, you're, you're constantly getting this updated in the background. You're not having to manually update it yourself. If we look at our DLP, uh, we have DLP policies here. You can see that we've got a DLP profile. It's the same principle. I can do this based upon a category here. So say it was cloud storage as my example. We would tend to do this for every category. Uh, we want our DLP to be on for everything. The same as a threat protection, we would want that to be on every category of web traffic or DLP on every web category. But we can go granular if we want to be less restrictive for one thing, more restrictive for others when it comes to DLP. We can do that. Uh, these DLP profiles here are where out of the box, Netscope are given tons of them. But they've uh, put together that match all types of uh, different DLP sources, different DLP flags, and so on. The main ones being GDPR, we've got here. GDPR, big thing, obviously, going to get heavy fines if you breach your GDPR. Uh, but with the GDPR, it can be very, very, very wide. Uh, one example I've got is working with a major retail company, uh, supermarkets up and down the UK. Well, racial identifier is a GDPR flag, and white, black, both of those are racial identifiers. If you can imagine how many things there are in a supermarket that have the word white or black in them. So you've got white bread, uh, white flour, white wine, etc. that, yeah, you tend to, DLP is not an exact science, you would have to go through and, and rule out your false positives if you were you were properly qualifying your data. However, these are fully customizable. You can do what you want with them. And it's the same principle. You pick your users it applies to, you pick the category of web traffic it applies to, you would pick your profile, you can pick multiple ones of these if you want, like PCI, EU, blah, blah, blah. And then you pick what you want to happen with it. And we can block. But you can set an action for each profile now. That never used to be there. And then our policy evaluation after the match. So it's going to be checking everything completely within that document instead of just stopping when it gets to, let's say, the trigger for it. Uh, if we jump into our DLP here, just to give you an idea of it, we'll go into rules first. So this is where we configure our rules. We have all of these predefined out of the box ones. Uh, going down to, like if I go to EU here, we can see that there's a whole host of uh, out of the box ones of date of birth and so on. They're looking for things like, uh, you, in fact, let's just configure one. Let's just go in and configure one. That's probably the easiest way. So if we go into new rule here, let's 
let's say we wanted to find a credit card with a expiry date. So if I put in uh, card numbers, so let's say major networks and all, and I just tick that, you can see here it's going to detect. Now it's it's doing a LUN calculation and everything on the card here to make sure it's a valid credit card number. Uh, if I pick that, I have now set up a rule that it's going to look for anything that contains a card number. However, it's not just a card number that we want to have. We also want to look for dates. So if we look for this, we have two for expiration dates. So we're going to pick both of them. Let me just put in that other one there. EDM and our English. So EDM would be your main number formats and various various ways of presenting it, such as American, obviously use month, day, uh, UK, UD, use day, month. Uh, but then we've got our, our English terms for them as well. So you've now got July, you've got seven, et cetera, given in word formats. Uh, but then what else would we want to do to cut down our false positives here? we could put in, we want to see the terms. Now a term would be where it mentions the word credit card actually in the document. So you could have card numbers here. So it's going to mention things like a uh, visa, CCN, credit card, account number, etc. Uh, and we just tick that as an option. Now I'm picking these from the out of the box Netscopy type things. You can fully customize this. You can do this with regexes. You can do this with dictionaries. You can upload your own text file of terms. So if you wanted to look for certain things like confidential, etc., you can. If I hit next here, we're choosing, is it going to be case sensitive and add our own uh, custom things? Like I, I mentioned regex and so on. We're not going to do that here. Uh, bah, 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 bah. We're not doing exact match. So here we've got, what is our expression going to be? So at the moment, it's saying P0 and P1 and P2 and P3. So P0 is our card number. Then we've got our dates. Then we've got our card number terms. So obviously, we don't want both dates given together. So we just put a little bracket around this. And we do an R. And now it's looking for card number and either one of the date formats, one or the other, and the terms format. Now we could also bracket these and make this an or as well. So that the terms don't even need to be given in the, the file that contains the credit card info. We're doing ands and ors here, but we can also do these near commands. You can see I can click, I can choose operators and so on from here. Uh, because I'm doing it manually, it's not like giving me that option. If I do near, I can change how close they would be. You can see here it's coming up as proximity check. I could make that check the entire thing, 500 characters. Usually these things would be right next to each other, the card number, the expiry date, the term, etc. But we could make it 500 characters out of that entire thing. And then, oh, sorry, my syntax is wrong because I've done that near there. Well, we're going to cancel out this anyway. If I left that as and, we would have been able to get past it. But there, so we, we can fully customize these rules. We can make our own. I can't change a predefined, but I could make as many rules as we want. As I mentioned, we can create new dictionaries of words and flags and identifying content. Uh, we can do exact matches, which is where we're going to actually be giving a, like something specific, really specific for it to look for. So for example, you can see here, it's, it's looking for a CSV format a file essentially. One thing that I've done it with is when I was looking for identifying, not essentially GDPR, but identifying information, we were looking for email addresses and so on. So think of like a, a sales team, maybe stealing business contacts, say a lever is leaving the company and they decide to steal a whole ream of intelligence uh, based on companies and contacts and email addresses and things like that. Then if I put in a rule to say look for emails, I'm going to get hits all the time. Especially when we write a statement of work, it's got a table in it that has maybe the project managers, the 
uh, business owner, tech leads, etc. All the contact information I'll put into a statement of work. Uh, project documentation would have that too. Well, I could put in here, ignore it if it's a Summerford employee because we're not counting that as our own identifiable information. We care about a third party information, uh, but we don't really count the employee information as identifiable when it comes to a statement of work. So therefore I can say if, the, if it's Summerford Associates uh, staff members, then ignore it by using things like this. Once we've created these rules, if we go back a page, we then create a profile and we can group them together into one lump. Uh, if I click on GDPR here, these are all the different rules that are going to be under the out of the box GDPR one. As I said, GDPR is very, very wide when it comes to what is identifiable information because it's anything that could be used to identify uh, you as an individual. So you can see here we've got even your weight, eye colour, etc. That's where you can run into issues with this. Getting the false positives right is a big thing. But for Netscope, I find it quite easy to do that to a certain degree because all I do is I can create a policy for DLP. Sorry, that was weird. Let me just go back in. So if I create a DLP policy, I get the different options here over what to do uh, when something triggers so I've got alert, I've got allow, I've got block. And I could set up an allow rule and it will flag every time that that rule is hit, but the user's still allowed to do what they want. Alert does the same thing. It just generates an alert in the system, uh, but allow is there if you had a corresponding block as well. So you can roll these out in such a way. Let me just pick the cloud storage here again. And let's do upload. I'll just say, oh, in fact, sorry, I should show you, there's way more constraints that you can apply. Uh, I chose login attempt before to show that you can pick between the username used. But here, when I'm doing an upload, you see that I get all these different options of what storage is it going to, the file type, the file size, etc. So for GDPR, you could you could say that, oh, it has to be over a certain, certain size, like ignore the file if it's less than a meg, that kind of idea. Uh, so if I save that, so we're looking for anything going to cloud storage for any user and they try and upload it. I can put in certain criteria, so destination country, for example. I, I want to say that if it's one of these risky countries that the, the action is taking place within, then indefinitely block it. We also have criteria up here under user for this, where we can boil it right down to the, the OS or the browser they're using. Uh, the country that they are currently in. And uh, we, could, we could be looking at things like that to, to create whole rules around. But under here, under our action, because I've now specified more options, you see that I get this user alert option too. So if I was going to roll this out, if I wanted to get intelligence on what my users were doing before I applied a DLP policy, I would put on one of these first. I would then see, based upon what I've chosen for my DLP rule, and for my DLP uh, profile, so say I picked the GDPR one and I found it was going to be very wide and I'm a bit, a bit tentative about turning it on, I would turn it on with one of these first and I would review it periodically within a, a certain time frame to see who triggered the rule and was it a legit trigger for that rule. Using that intelligence and, and feedback from the company I'm working with, I would then tweak that rule so that we cut down on the false positives uh, we, we look at what could we add to this to make it a much more refined DLP rule. Because you are going to get false positives on metadata. For example, with the credit card uh, option that I chose there, I've seen a trigger with metadata. You get to pick between metadata content or both when you, it comes to creating a, a DLP profile on this. But in the back end of a website, the code that's used, all the the random digits and so on that can be in the metadata of a transmit can trigger credit card info a lot. That's why I'm using as many qualifying uh, identifiers as possible is good, such as date, terms, and card. You can even add name to that as well, because you have to have the person's name usually if you wanted to use a credit card for something. Uh, so therefore, you want to look at what is it that's triggering it? Is it a legit trigger? Look at those alerts have it worked out, get the, the 
rules tweaked until you see less of them, until you get that sweet spot where what you're triggering looks to be accurate. Now, I would say you're never going to get it 100% right when it comes to DLP, because there's all different types of files and everything transmitting everywhere, gigs and gigs of them sitting on OneDrive and so on. With this, you just want to get it as close to that sweet spot as possible and, and, and not miss any. So don't go too crazy with being lax with it, but get to that sweet spot. Then once you've got that rule down to where you think it should be, rather than just turning it on and ruining people's days because they now think they can't use the internet the way they used to, you put on this user alert. And what that user alert does is it, it warns the user whatever you want to warn them. So say, for example, today's the 3rd of January. Uh, we were bringing in DLP on the 1st of February. Then I spend the next couple of weeks going through all these alerts and so on, seeing what's been triggered and tweaking the policy. And then for the last two weeks of January, I put on the user alert. So when the user does trigger the rule, if they do, they get an alert that says, you have triggered a DLP alert here. If you did this after the 1st of February, you would have been blocked from doing this work. So therefore, if this is a legit piece of work you should be doing, let us know. Come to us, tell us, tell us what's going on. Or you could even just give them a little option to justify, type in a text, text box, uh, to see why they were doing what they were doing before they can proceed. And then when you're ready, you put it into the block mode. So as of the 1st of February, put it in the block. So we've done our investigation using these two. We've then widened it out and allowed the users to give their feedback here. And then we block as of the first of February. And if I jump into our user notification section here, you can create these templates in any way, shape, or form you want. You can add logos to it. You can color them in, et cetera. You can add all kinds of stuff to it, like uh, variable information. Uh, so you can see here I've got a variable option where we can be adding things that are going to be generated based upon like the file name you have tried to upload. And then it's just a piece of code to say insert the file name here so that we get that customized alert when they see it. Because here I've got the option for the justifications here to say they can type in a piece of text to say why they were doing it. If I click user alert, we've got a proceed button. We can fully customize what those buttons say. But then we get to a stage where the user was fully informed the DLP was coming in, and now it's enacted. If I come back to my policies. So that covers us off for Secure Web Gateway and our DLP. Uh, CASB, same principle. I mean, to me, CASB is in the equivalence of categories where a category like cloud storage has Google Drive, OneDrive, etc. A CASB uh, definition is an application with all those domains specified under it. The way to see that, I think, if we jump back to the Cloud Confidence Index that Netscope has, and we look for Amazon S3, and then I click on it, and we do show all, every single one of these domains, Netscope has determined are an S3. Uh, domain that's used. I mean, they've got it split down by OS type. We've got Android here, Chrome OS, uh, iOS. There will be a desktop one in here somewhere, Discovery, SFDR, desktop. So when you when you visit one of these websites, if I was to go to this right now, it would be flagged by Netscope as being Amazon S3. In the same way that a category groups together like all the gambling sites into one place. A CAD B app definition is really just a bunch of domains grouped together. In Netscope, we can take it right down to the process level where if you've got a client-based installation of something like OneDrive, you can be controlling it based upon the exe file that is transmitting and receiving that web data. We can do that in the back end in our speeding options. Um, but that is CASB. So the same principles apply for your DLP. If I come back to my real-time protection, if I choose Cloud App Access and we go back to our Google Drive option. So now, instead of me manually putting in URLs like drive.google.com and so on to identify Google Drive, we can now lump it together with this. So I said before that you run into issues when you're using categories for cloud storage. If you were to do 
a block and try to allow Google Drive without having this element, the CASB element, you would run into a lot of issues. And the reason for that is, is Google, if you go in, if you've ever done a heart check, so if I go into my more tools here, uh, develop tools, and then we go to our network, and then I refresh this page. So you can see you get a million hits here. And uh, this is me showing all of the different connections that have just been made in the different uh, content and sources and downloads, etc. that have just happened. The minute that I hit refresh on that page, you do that in a Google website and it will be like about a thousand long or something like that. You'll get all different appy.googleclient.com. Uh, you'll get your drive.google.com. You'll get your standard google.com. Uh, you'll get tons of different URLs in here. But the minute that you try to create a URL-based exception for Google Drive, you would be there all day trying to work out the URLs that have to be accepted for it. Whereas if I just choose Google Drive from here, that should capture all of them that Netscope have identified are used by Google Drive. And it's the exact same principle. I can create now a DLP policies for an app like this. I still get this granular application-based uh, activity. I can still be restricting uploads, uh, downloads, etc., from Google Drive, applying it to users, same criteria, uh, same options I get where I can block and so on. It, it's just the same principle, but we've now lumped all the domains together. And let's go through that as part of the CASB side of this. If we now look at the next step up, something new is in our policy options there. Let me just cancel it with this. In our policy options, you see we get this email outbound. So the way that I like to walk through these types of things is if I think of, if I've got a file here right now, so I've got a file sitting on my desktop, how can I steal it? What can I do to steal that file? So I want to take it and I want to go to box.com and I want to upload it to box.com and I want to steal it that way. So I go to box, I register on account, I log in, I click upload, I find the file and I upload it. Well, with the secure web gateway element of this, we've shown that we would stop that because we'd be blocking all cloud storage. However, we would be allowing our sanctioned cloud storage with Google Drive and we would only be allowing logins to our Google Drive using our work pub work based account. So therefore using the CASB and the swig element of this, we have blocked me from being able to go online and upload that file to the internet uh, to a cloud storage application. And if we wanted to, we could create a DLP rule to identify what's in that file and therefore we would stop it going that way. Oh actually one more thing about DLPs, most of the customers that I've spoken to they tend to focus on things like GDPR. They tend to focus on identifiable information and so on. But it's not what they feel their audits on. It's actually on things like source code and encrypted files. So we've got source code and password protected are out of the box elements of Netscope. Uh, auditors are looking for these things as well as your GDPR, your identifiable information, your exfiltration points and so on. So they're already covered and in uh, Netscope, so therefore think of those two when you're thinking of your DLP. But if I was to now try and upload that file on the internet and I can, how else would I try to get it out of my machine? Well, the next step is I would try and email it to myself, but you can see that I've got this email option here. Now, if I am using Gmail and I go to Gmail in my browser right now and I click to attach it to a uh, an email, that's going to count as a web upload. So it should still be getting checked via my Netscope at that point because it's it's web traffic that is attaching that file to my, my email. However, you might have a client-based email tool. You might have, like, say, Outlook installed on a machine, and therefore it's not a web transaction that's attaching a file. Or that file may already be sitting in my inbox, so there's no need for me to attach it anymore. And I want to send it to myself. I want to send it to a personal account. Well, this email option actually allows Netscope to hook into Gmail or 0365, 
and it will actually check the content of a file. If I choose Gmail here, so this is again for all users, we could choose any users we want here. And our option is send. We could do it as individual users. So we could say, I mean, we've got our constraints here. So if the email address matches a work employee, like at some of associates.com, then allow it. If it doesn't, we could block it. But we want to set a constraint. So any email that's sent via Gmail that's hooked into this, if I was to go and configure it, I, can't, I don't have a Gmail to configure with it. So I can't hook it. This is a test domain, a test tenant. So I can't hook this into the company email. But if this was hooked into our Gmail, then I could put on DLP rules to say, well, if it contains this GDPR profile, anything that matches this, then we're going to alert or we're going to allow or we're going to add this little header to it, this little SMTP header. And therefore, we could be capturing that that email has now went. We've got that visibility that that has now happened. It's now, it's now caught for us. We now see it that I've done that. So if we now think of our emails covered, well, at least, sorry, our emails covered for Office 365, it's covered for our Gmail and so on. But how else can I steal that file? So we've covered off, we've got our web. So we've got our secure web gateway blocking cloud storage, blocking uploads. Uh, again, we're, we're not blocking the entire internet, we're only blocking the activities of the sites granularly as to what we want to control. We've got our CASB implemented to allow our sanctioned apps like Google Drive, all kept together that these are the apps we use. So therefore, we're, we've got rules applied for them and everything else is maybe blocked or restricted. We've now got email, so our, our main email uh, tool doesn't rely on a web transaction for me to upload an attachment to it. So therefore, we're, we're also monitoring that for exfiltration. The next step for me would be I am going to RDP onto maybe a machine in my house. So I'm working at home. I have a PC sitting right in front of me right now. I'm on this MacBook sitting here. Uh, on my table behind me, I've actually got a PC sitting. So what if I just RDP to that, and then I just transfer the file straight onto my personal machine? Well, if we come into the back end of here, this is the back end of the tenant. So I just got here by clicking settings. Front end is for all your policies and so on. Back end is for like administration of the tenant itself. So we could maybe set our users and so on. But if we go into security cloud platform and app definition here, we see this now says cloud and firewall apps. And if I do firewall app here, what is our application? We don't have any. We've never made one before, so therefore it's going to be a new custom app. And I put in say home RDP destination IP. We're not going to do anything because we wouldn't know. I mean, most home users are going to be 192.168.1. Dot blah blah blah. So therefore, we will leave this blank. But we're going to see we want it to be TCP 3389. And just for talking sake, we'll block them from SSH SCP as well. And we save that. We now have an application specified here called Home RDP. I'm going to apply changes. And if we come back to our policies, we have this firewall option here. So again, it is any user. So we can pick our users individually. Our source, we can be mucking around with, like source egress, source IP user, etc. We get a bit more granularity here as to as to what our source is going to be. Obviously, for us, we're looking for it to be our user. Uh, we're not looking for egress because we, we're on a local uh, network. So I'm sitting on a 192 address right now. I'm not on the front end IP uh, connecting to the internet via my router and inside my bubble in the home. Uh, my application, we want that to be home RDP, where are our options? So it should be a private app. Firewall, 
Yep, sorry. I'm taking it to be private app because it would be a custom. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Private inside your network, but it's just their definition of application there. So I've got home RDP and I could block it, which means that our users cannot RDP off of their machines. So we've now stopped them from RDPing to local devices. We could put rules in here that allow them to still be able to connect to the office if there was support requirements and so on, if there was a, a, a method for that. But we've essentially blocked them from RDP, SCP, SSH. If that's not something they should be doing as part of their job, we can block that. So that's your cloud firewall now working. Now, obviously, we've got a client running on this machine. I have a Netscope client running. You can see the icon here. So you have to have that client to get that rule enacted. But it's another way of stopping that data exfiltration from taking place. If we now think of how else could we steal that data? So what have we covered? We've got our secure web gateways blocking our web. Casby's controlling our web. We've got our email checking what we're sending out. Uh, we've got the cloud firewall enabled, and it's now going to stop us as well. But if we uh, go down through these rules, I should have one already set up because it's better to see this in real time. So there's a reverse proxy one there. Am I going to be able to log into it from here though? Because I'm already in my work one. And let's do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my next go client. Uh, we will turn on this. So what we're looking for, we'll look for that's going to block downloads from Google Drive if logging in via the reverse proxy. I'm going to enable that and I'm going to apply changes. So now if I click my little icon here and I add and sign in. No, we don't want Chrome profile. We want Google Drive. Uh, actually, I will do this via a private browser. Do, 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 do. Bah, 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 window and drive.google.com. There we go. That will get us around the, the login restriction I was about to hit there. So if I go to drive.google.com, uh, I pop in next up demo workshop. So this is the demo account. You can see this is already, so our users themselves are hooked into Okta as well. So we're using centralized user management, not just for administration of the tenant, but for the actual user experience too. We're using the, the Okta integration. With the, we could enable MFA on this, but I don't do that because I need a mobile for it. Uh, and it becomes a nightmare for me when I, I start doing all these test accounts and so on and using MFA for them. So we'll, we'll pretend that we've got MFA on this. So I would hit next there. I would then pop in the password. Once I hit submit, I would get asked for the MFE details. I'm not going to in this instance. But we've now logged into Google Drive. My Netscope client is off on this machine, as you can see. So I've got no Netscope in my way, right? I'm going to try and download this file. And what happened? It didn't let me. So I just got blocked from downloading a file from Google Drive. I can upload a file to Google Drive if I want to. I can't download a file from Google Drive. And the reason for that is we are actually going via Netscope right now. And if you look at the address here, you can see it says drive.google.com.rproxy.ghostoke.com. We have been sent through Netscope, even though it didn't look like we were. And the user doesn't really notice it unless they, they really pay attention to their address bar. The user experience is exactly the same. It's just that we have now got a restriction on us downloading from Google Drive because we have a policy in Netscope to stop us doing it. And just to walk through what happened, to make sense of it, the reason I opened, I turned off the Netscope client first of all, because if it detects a Netscope client in the way, it won't work because the Netscope client is stealing the traffic via Netscope anyway. 
So I turned off the Netscope client. So I'm essentially acting like a user that doesn't have a Netscope client running on the machine. The reason I opened up the incognito window was so that I was logging in uh, and had to log into Google like afresh. Because when I went to Google, I was given a not to log in screen. So the way that it works is Okta is acting as the IDP for my Google Drive or Google as a whole. So I go to Google, I put in my username, it sends me to Okta, Okta asks for my information. Okta at that point should hand me back to Google, but it doesn't, it hands me back to Netscope. Netscope then hands me back to Google, but I'm going via Netscope. So I've got a little tunnel going right now, even though I don't have a client enabled on my machine or installed, I've got a connection via Netscope, which means that policies can now be enacted in my Google Drive against me, even when I don't have a client running. So I'm just going to close down this incognito window. And if we go back and look at the, the policy for this, you can see that for that user I logged in with, if they are using the reverse proxy, not client, if they're using the reverse proxy to Google Drive and they try and download, block them. And don't tell them why, but block them. They wouldn't get a notification anyway because you only get the notification if you're using the client. I've put it to no notification mute because it happens all the time when I'm doing these tests and so on. So we just block it. I can't download. And I can make that upload. I can make that anything I want. Now, this to me is really powerful, but people don't really use it the way they should. Think of this as not, they, they see it as, oh, it's bring your own device. So therefore, if I've got a third party contractor that's not allowed to have a Netscope client installed on the machine from our company, but we want them to use our Google Drive, then we want to use reverse proxy. So it's always, it's talked about that way with the bring your own device aspect. I don't see it as that, so I see it as the DLP. I see it as the data exfiltration. If you remember, we at Summerford, we're a Google house. So you want to, you want to stop me getting that file. You want to stop me stealing that important document. Well, the only thing stopping me doing so when I'm on my company machine is that I've got the Netscope client running on my device. It's controlling everything that I do on the web. If I don't also lock down my Google Drive to say only users from a certain IP can log into it, then I would be able to log into my summer for Google Drive from my personal machine. And my personal machine does not have a client running on it. So all I do is I go and try and get that file off of my work machine and it doesn't let me. So remember, Netscope's controlling it every way that you can think of. It's stopping me from, oh, there's one other actual data exfiltration thing. I don't have it though. Let me just check. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Yeah, so I, I don't have it, but there's another aspect which is endpoint protection. The one that we didn't cover there was we didn't cover, I need to remove that policy actually. Okay. We didn't cover uh, if I wanted to transfer it to a USB stick or if I wanted to print it and so on. Let's go and stop that too. It's called endpoint protection. Uh, but I don't have it on this tenant, so I can't show it in any way, shape, or form. But we've covered all the bases for me getting that file. I'm using my work machine. We're stopping me from getting the file off of my box. But I can put it back into Google Drive because I'm allowed to. So I upload it to my company Google Drive, and then I go onto the PC right next to me, and I log into my company Google Drive from my personal device. And then I download it from there. And because I've downloaded it from there, nobody knows, there'd be no idea what I did. And I don't have a client running on that machine. So there's no controls in any way, shape, or form. So I've just stolen the file. But that reverse proxy, the minute I logged in from my personal device, I've now got that control. It's not about bringing your own device, it's preventing bringing your own device, in my opinion. But it's talked about in a big way about that it supports third party contractors. But yes, that's one way that it can be used, but I see it as more important to use it for phishing and so on. Because if you think about it, if, I, if I'm in a Google house, so 
I get fished one day. I log in at Summerford and I've got a fake email sitting in my inbox and I get fished and someone gets all my details and they log into my Google Drive. They're not going to be coming in from a machine that's got an SQL client running. So therefore, we could put policies on to say, if we don't trust you at all, if you're coming in from a client, uh, from a machine that doesn't have a client, then therefore we're not going to let you do anything in here. We're not going to allow you to look at any files, upload, download, etc. We don't know who you are. We're going to, we're going to stop you in that way. The reverse proxy would stop that. You could create a policy that would essentially stop phishing completely. I've I've created a video before on about 10 different ways that you can use Netscope to, to completely, I won't say completely, but mitigate to a certain degree phishing within an organization. Uh, things like not allowing login attempts to unknown websites, uh, that reverse proxy, those types of things can all be layered together to stop phishing, in my opinion. I won't say 100% because you just never know, but I think with Netscope you could absolutely absolutely rule it out 99% of the time for the types of controls that you can put in this. So if we walk through it again, that file that I had in my machine, I cannot upload it anywhere on the internet. It's getting checked both from a DLP point of view and when I'm trying to send it. I can't attach it to an email. If it's already in my email or it's on a client-based email system like a, a web, uh, sorry, a, an application on my machine that doesn't even upload, or an attachment, then I'm checking it if it's going to be Gmail or 0365 or it being sent out the way. If I try to put it on a USB stick, we've got the endpoint uh, detection. If I try and RDP to a local device and copy it to that, we've got the firewall element that's going to stop it. And then if I try and upload it to Google Drive and log in from a personal machine to then download it, we've got the reverse proxy there that's going to stop me from being able to do anything with that file once that happens. Uh, there's a bunch of other things in here. I mean, that's pretty much covered all the, the main things for me. Uh, one other thing we've got, we're, we're using in some of it is the, the private access. So if you imagine I'm working at home, we have resources that are sitting in a, a data center down south. I had to, I used to use, I used to use this VPN to get to it, so that app VPN I would use to, to get to those resources. So I would connect to the VPN first, and then I could RDP and SSH and so on. We don't have that anymore. We have private access. So Netscope, we put a Netscope publisher into our network, and it connects to our Netscope tenant. I connect to my Netscope tenant via this client, and it's like an always-on VPN. So I can open up a web browser right now, click a button, and I can just go straight to any website that's hosted internally, like non-internet facing website, or I can RDP SSH to a number of devices that we've got sitting in our little server farm down there. All done via the next week. So we're, that app gate can go essentially off my machine, it's not used anymore. It's only used at the moment because we've only just put in the private access in the past month, just in case there is a well, we're still paying for it as well because eventually it will be stopped paid for. But we've got this is essentially active like a private access connection for me. So it's another part of that secure service edge. That's our zero trust network access now. Uh, it's getting covered there. You can see here we've got the cloud threat exchange where we can be uh, sharing and getting cloud threat information. Uh, that's a separate a separate entity though. You would set up your own VM with a, a Netscope, uh, essentially container for that, container-based app for that. It's not hooked into this at all, as you can see. Like I've, I don't have options for it in any of my my choices here. But you would integrate it into your tenant once you install it. Uh, in here, what have we got? RBI. So we've got remote browser isolation. That was one other aspect of the policies. So if I choose a web access policy under my action, we have isolate now as a as an option. So if you have risky, I mentioned risky websites earlier. So we had all those security risk options, uncategorized, etc. Rather than out and out block them, you could choose isolate. And all it's doing is before it hits the user's browser. Netscope open it on a browser at their end and show the content from there. 
So you're doing that rather than me launching what could essentially be malware on my own machine, you're launching it on their machine and showing you the content and checking it for threats and so on as they're doing so. That's essentially remote browser isolation. So you could be having that instead of blocking certain risky things. So remember that companies are moving away from that restrictive uh, internet usage and uh, with the, the nature of the internet now, it just causes a lot of problems, lots of support tickets and so on, when you start going crazy, locking stuff down. As I mentioned earlier, the example was Amazon S3. If I went and blocked Amazon uh, S3 or cloud storage as a category, I'm going to run into all kinds of problems with it. Uh, I would just get support tickets all day long saying I can't visit this website. You would go and check the website and it turns out that half of it has been delivered by Amazon S3. Uh, file servers and so on. So let's go picking that up as cloud storage. There's no way around that. You would have to go and manually put your URL lists to say allow, allow, allow. Uh, so you want to move away from that restrictive uh, aspect of internet control. You've got your threat protection in there. I say to customers that, you know, rather than block half the internet, just block the activities that you don't want them to do. So think of it as when it comes to DLP, yes, block things like Dropbox and Box.com and so on. Uh, but what do you want to block? Do you want to block the site completely? Or do you want to block the user logging into the site? Do you want to block the user uploading to the site? Do those kinds of things. And then you don't get your users coming to you every five minutes saying, I can't do this or I can't do that. Yes, they can't do the things they're not supposed to be doing, but you give them a very clear user notification. So if I come into here and I put into here, you should not be using anything but Google Drive. And then I could redirect the users to drive.google.com. I will we'll be a bit more polite here for uploading files. So therefore, if a user tried to go and upload a file to see some website somewhere, it would be, you should not be doing that. You should be using Google Drive. And then once they hit OK on that message, they're going to be taken straight to drive.google.com. But you make this clearer than what I've put here. You could link them to, rather than send them here, you could link them to an internal document or a, a, a guide somewhere or something to further educate them or just put the information in here as to what they should be doing instead. And it means that they, or even put in your entire policy here for what should they do next if they think it's a false, a false hit on a block or something, uh, to educate them as much as possible to cut down on those support tickets. The people say, no, I can't do this. You know, one of the big things I've seen recently is that companies were blocking streaming sites and they're blocking it because people were watching Netflix all day and so on, especially working at home. They were watching Netflix instead of working. So they were sitting watching Netflix or uh, using their, their machine to watch Netflix while in company and property. So obviously the bandwidth bills incorporated and stuff like that. However, if you go to most news sites these days, if I go into our web checker here, uh, policies and web, and then URL lookup, go to dailymail.com. And oh, that's a bad one. Let's try Sky News. Is that a bad one? That's a bad one. Let's try a times online.com. Still coming up with news media. Come on, give me another one, Guardian. Uh, Guardian.co.uk. There you go. So Guardian obviously is a newspaper as we know it. However, it's flagged as streaming and downloadable video now. The reason I've gone through so many news sites there is I've seen it come up. It seems to be more and more news sites are getting recategorized as streaming and downloadable video because they host so much uh, online video on their websites. Like if you go to BBC News right now, you will find you can watch iPlayer directly through the news uh, section of the the news.bbc.co.uk 
or you can watch highlights of football matches, the World Cup and so on. You can watch user-generated videos sometimes when they're running some kind of like wildlife competition or something like that. So if you block streaming, you've now blocked half of your news sites. So all you get is users coming to you now saying, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that. So don't block streaming. If you have a specific issue with Netflix, block Netflix. And we can go to our CCI here and we can try and find Netflix and see if it's already flagged and there it is. So under the CASB side of things, you just need to block Netflix.com or you need to block this application and then you've stopped Netflix. But you haven't blocked half the internet for your users because you haven't blocked streaming and downloadable video as a whole. However, I would question streaming and downloadable video going through Netscope at all. Yes, yes, it'd be good to block it uh, and allow, or, you know, it'd be good to allow all users to use it. However, like if you're using collaboration tools and things like that, you're putting a third party in the way where it's having to check all that content. So if I was using, say, meet.google.com and it's a, a web conferencing tool and it's having to go through Netscope, I will be degrading, uh, degrading the performance of that application coming through Netscope. So I'd probably bypass something like that uh, from going through Netscope, depending on what it was. If it posed a security risk, if it was something I could upload to, definitely never going to bypass it. But if it's a site like Netflix that I can only download from, I would probably bypass it so that it's not going through Netscope. And there we go. So there are other aspects. I mean, that's still not covering everything Netscope do. One of the most recent ones we're looking at is now Borderless WAN. So you're essentially thinking you're now moving into software-defined wider area networks where instead of you using like an ISP-based MPLS, you're going to be able to do all of that yourself. You could create your own entire network using Netscope. It's the same principle as this I see it as. It's like they say essentially having a massive uh, Netscope client sitting as a connection going to Netscope and then to your destination where you can enact all these controls and so on on it. It's way too much to go into a call like this. It needs it would need its own dedicated call to go into that in great detail. But that's really it. So just to, to recap, we've got the secure web gateway. Again, think of it from the point of view of what is it we want to control. We want to control what happened to that file. I'm not no longer thinking about, well, I just want to block a gambling website. Think of it as we want to we want to control our data. So therefore, secure web gateway, we can now block the sites that the user can go to. We can block the activities the user can perform on those sites. We can control the users who can log into those sites from an idea of that constraint where the username that they are using so that they're no longer using business addresses on, on unsanctioned sites or using personal addresses to get to sanctioned sites. So there's two elements to that. Uh, I say using business addresses on unsanctioned sites. Phishing, a big thing with phishing. You don't need to be fished to be fished. If I go to box.com right now and I sign up for it using my company account and then box gets hacked tomorrow and I use the same password as my current company uh, password, then obviously someone's now got my company password and the company aren't aware of that because I should never have been logging into box.com with my company account in the first place. So why don't you stop users from logging into third party sites uh, using their company account is another aspect of that constraint. Uh, so. The file can't leave me over the web and I can't upload it to Gmail either because if I try and attach it, it's going to be going over the web. But we've got the email checker on there too for the email outbound where if I do have a, a client-based application doing it, then it's at least going to be seeing me doing it that way if I'm using uh, it was Gmail or Office 365 uh, Outlook. It's not all email, just those two. So we've got that element too. We had the uh, I can no longer RDP or SSH or SCP because we've got the cloud firewall was instigated. So I can't just RDP to a local device and send it that way. With the endpoint DLP that I couldn't show, so the endpoint protection, I couldn't show the USB side of it. I don't have that on here. But it's a Netscope element where if I tried to copy it onto a USB stick and that was uh, 
enabled as a feature with my client, I wouldn't be able to do that either. And if I uploaded it to my company instance and then tried to log into that on a personal machine, the reverse proxy would now kick in and that would stop me from from logging in or or at least getting the file. So I showed the example where I couldn't download a file. So we at least had that control. I, I tried to log in. I'm not blocked, but I can't download the file. Can't get to it. And then the last way I would steal the file is if you gave me permission to view it, I would take a photo of it with my phone because there is always a way to steal data. <laughs>